in the control no yes go ahead so far so good B2 max block in Walpole. It's the bottom step in the step system. It's a point in the system where they're supposed to take everything away from you, you to have nothing, and you to eventually work your way out of the system. So the B section um, houses um, men who have been determined through the classification system to be management problems. Um, people who receive a lot of D reports, or people who choose not to go to the A section. Um, there are some people who are housed in the B section who um, do not agree with the institutional work policy, um, which is a criteria for men to move from B section to the A section. They still dictate a policy that anyone leaving from the max end to the, to the minimum end has to work in the license plate shop. That's the first thought by If you're not ready and willing to do that, then you just automatically disapprove for the, for the minimum end. They want you in the license plate shop because uh, it's the only place in the state where license plates are made. The plate shop doesn't teach you any kind of skill. There's too many people going out of here without any kind of alternatives to stay out, to keep them out in the street. They don't have any skills. They don't have any kind of education. If they had an education, if they taught them a trade where they could do something useful with their time while they're here that they could apply on the street, then it'd be understandable. But the only reason they send you down there is, is it's big money. They want you to work, and you work for them. It's like slave labor. They have an overload of people there. You have people just sitting there all day long playing cards, not even working. Yet you have to report to these shops. I don't want to work there. I imagine sooner or later I'm going to have to agree to work there if I ever want to get out of the max end. Do you want to go right upstairs, or do you want to see the block? Sure, I'll see the block. It's two block. Ah, uh, I don't know. This is it. This is where we live. Ah, uh, this is the galley up here. They control all the all the doors. As you can see, there's no kind of there's no kind of real privacy up here. It's all open, barred front can't do anything without being uh, under the eye. My goodness, what are you doing here? All right, uh, might as well go upstairs, show you where I live. <laughs> I don't know, we're going up. The guy's locked up down there. He's trying to get a shower. He's doing isolation time. Right? And they, they only give you a shower once every five days with isolation time. Trying to get a shower and uh, jerking them around. Those are the nice clean showers we have. Lock the door. Body one. They're just trying to give me a hard time or what? They don't like this? No, not you. I know, you ain't nothing. They're putting you in the middle too. You have to listen to me, right?
Classification is not a matter of me, but a matter of how they see me. Uh, if they feel that I am not uh, minimum material, and by minimum material means least amount of trouble or, uh, or less vocal or whatever, then I will be minimum. If they feel that I am boisterous, that I tend to speak up for what I want, uh, that I will display my emotions when I feel they need to be displayed, then I become maximum material because I'm considered to be unmanageable. All right. There's no real, I can't understand this, this, this process of classification. Mr. Dijonet, how you doing? I'm Nancy Fallon, um, I'm your new social worker. Uh, I'm here today because you're going to be seeing a board. Um, how you doing? Okay, I guess. Good. How much time have you served in the sentence so far? Oh, about two and a half years. About two and a half years. Well, I'm bringing you up to a Walpole Classification Board um, next week, and one of the things that we'll deal with um, is whether or not you'd be appropriate for lower security. Have you given any thought to that? Yes, I've given it some thought. We are <laughs> giving it plenty of thought. I don't blame you. Um, where are you thinking about um, requesting to move to? Well, uh, to the pre-release, you know, and hopefully, uh, hope they obtain residence in the frame of hand. To a pre-release center. Um, have you ever been to a pre-release center before? Yes, I have. You have. Um, I think I should warn you. Um, more men go to medium or minimum security. Um, than do to pre-release centers because there's kind of a shock um, between maximum security and pre-release. Uh, there's a very dramatic difference um, between the two. Would you be willing to go to another walled facility if they didn't find you to be suitable for pre-release? Uh, yes, most definitely. Would you go to Norfolk? Yes, I guess I would. It would be a change of environment. Anyway. Mm -hmm. It might be easier for you to go to Norfolk um, and do well down there and then make a move to pre-release from there. There are more men going to pre-release centers from Norfolk than there are from Walpole. may not be that happy with that, but... Uh, well, well, you know, being incarcerated, well, I've been incarcerated going on three years, and after that time, you learn to be patient. Mm -hmm. You certainly must. If you go from the maximum end into the minimum end, and then your next step might be Norfolk, whereas if you, if you fuck up in Norfolk, they don't send you back one step to the minimum end, they turn you all the way around and send you back to the max end of Walpole again, which is totally negative to the word rehabilitation. Behind the scenes, so to speak, everybody knows that there's no such thing as rehabilitation. Uh, there's no real effort made towards that. Uh, as much as officers are called correctional officers, their performance is as guards. You know, they're here to maintain security, to keep you here, and to keep the place secure. Well, we have inmates here that, well, you know people just like them on the street. I do, too. I live next door to them, and so do you. And, and it might be you, and it might be me tomorrow. And we're regular people. But when you're cast into a place like this, you don't, you're not normal anymore. You're, you're, you're the animal, whatever animal you have to be to survive. You'll survive, or you're going to go under. And, well, if it doesn't do anything else, I think Walpole builds character. You know, it gives you a lot of inner strength. If you can come out of Walpole, if I, if I come out of Walpole every day, and I'm in one piece and I'm, you know, relatively sane, I feel as though that was a, a certain accomplishment. I suppose inmates, whether they're doing three years or 23 years, they can come out of here with some, some semblance of uh, normality. I suppose they, they conquered this. Miguel, what are you trying to get, a shower? I got a shower. All right, let me ask him about it.
we're supposed to play the role of on autonomous, I guess, where we just walk around with no feelings, no emotions, uh, nothing that's done to us or said to us should, should strike us or have any uh, effect on us. And uh, it's a terrible price. It's a, it's a very heavy price. Uh, because if you live that lie uh, for a year, two years, and, and suppress your feelings, uh, you know, it's like packing a keg full of dynamite. Yeah. And I think it's going to explode somewhere. Some people are lucky enough that they can maintain their self long enough to be able to carry it back to the street with them. But when they get to the street, somewhere down the line, they're going to snap and say, wait a minute, you know, there's no reason for me to hold it anymore, and it's going to explode. You know, other people are unfortunate where they can't control it, you know, and so they end up in 10 block or 9 block or the max center or wherever, you know, uh, for expressing their emotions. Right now I work in block 10, which is the departmental segregation unit. Um, it's the most secure unit in the state. I went from the A section, working in the A section as a social worker, to Block 10, which was a very dramatic change in environment. Um, people in the A section are getting close, hopefully, to moving on to another facility, whereas in Block 10, people are moved there because they pose a threat to the security of the institution, the safety of others. When a man is removed from population and moved up to Block 10, He's locked in his room, for the most part, 23 hours a day. I got a uh, film crew at the end of the tier here. I'm going to close the door so you can take a gander at this. What do you got here? got a film crew at the end of the tier. Where are you from? We're independent filmmakers. You're independent filmmakers. Since I've been here, um, there have been 13 murders, um, numerous assaults, um, which include inmate against inmate, inmate against officer, or pre allegations of officer against inmate. Um, it's very difficult to work in that type of environment because something is always happening. Things may be going along at a very steady pace, and then bang. We get back, Michael Barrows from court. And he won't go in block two. Uh, he guy. went. He went yep. with a fight. No, he's oh, with Mr. Cow and I went. Right, Mr. Briggs. Who, who, who wouldn't he go for? Uh, Bob Easingwood. Oh, well, no, uh, you convinced him we're running the prison this week? Yep. Oh, that was nice. That was nice of you. I might come in one day and I might have had a tough time out on the street, because it's not easy on the street. And I'm not realizing it, but, well, it's an inmate in here might have, be having a tough time. And now we're forced to interact. And uh, I have a chip on my shoulder and he has a chip on his shoulder. We're in a position now where there might be a problem over, over something totally unrelated. We're, we're pit against each other to, to, I don't know, iron out a situation. This, this inmate might overreact. As, and likewise, I might overreact, and I might overreact in a violent nature, and he, he also might overreact in a violent nature. I, that might be due to peer pressure. It might be due to the fact that that's how we happen to I identically want to uh, vent our frustrations. So, 
Well, when angers fly, people get hurt. Sometimes innocent people get hurt. They came into two block one night at uh, 9.30, quarter of 10 at night, when everyone was locked in their cells to take a man out. And there was five of them with a shield. One of them had a shield. They had helmets. They had clubs. Right? Uh, the doors are run electrically from a galley window. Right? And there's a panel up in the galley they open the doors with. As they were going down the tier, they told the guy they signaled to the, the cop in the galley to open the, uh, open the door. They didn't even give the, the guy in the cell the option of coming out. If you want to come out peaceably, are we going to have to come in and get you? They just charged right in. Right? They took him out. They beat him. They beat him all the way. They beat him right past my cell. I watched him go by. Uh, they took a guy next door to me out. They started beating him going out. Uh, they took two others out. I saw one guy on one knee with his hands handcuffed behind his back trying to get up from the floor saying, stop it, I've had enough. And I saw a cop come over with a shotgun and butt stroke him in the face with a shotgun. If that's not brutality, I don't know what is. I, uh, maybe someone needed to be restrained or something, but uh, restraint is just that, restraining them. Once a man's handcuffed behind his back, uh, any kind of force that may have been needed to begin with should be stopped right there. It shouldn't go any further. Uh, brutality exists in here. Does your pet live better than this, your dog, or your fish, or your cat? Is the zoo kept up better than this? Norfolk is, in my opinion, a halfway point, halfway between the initial incarceration and the release to, final release to the community, whether parole or discharge. Um, so Norfolk serves essentially as a proving ground. We're a very open institution. There's no physical constraints. Therefore, men come down here and interact with each other, with staff, and participate in the programs. And that says something. It says something about the way that they're getting along, what opportunities they want to make for themselves, and begins forming the, sort of the track record for the man as to suitability for eventual transfer onto minimum security, uh, where the security controls or external controls would be even less, and pre-release. It was a great relief for me to leave Walpole. Coming down here, I can really breathe, and at the same time, I have some I can use my own decision-making process in regards to my life. You know, I can make individual decisions for myself. I have more responsibility towards doing my time. Uh, I can participate in what programs I want to participate in. I can clothe and feed myself. I have opportunities to uh, get involved in advocations. I have opportunities to further my education. Okay, that's in Venice, folks. Let's start as we always do, with trying to understand what was happening. What's the story about? What's happening in this story? What happens when he's in Venice? Well, he... he why do you wait? Why do you, what happens? I, I laughed because all his life he had been dodging from pleasing himself or uh -huh, uh -huh. taking to himself the benefits or the richnesses that he deserved uh -huh, from his uh -huh. right and everything. 
and he's seen this young boy, and the boy was 14 with features that he equated in his mind to the gods and all that. And he found himself worshiping these boys' features, and this was the hidden part of Okay, but what's this attraction to this 14-year-old boy? Oh, uh, what? Since he was a writer, he was attracted to the Greek and Roman history. Mm -hmm. This uh, youth kept on representing a Greek god to him. The stature, the body, the body, and uh, the walk, the grace. And this kept on reflecting that Greek culture to him. Mm -hmm. how, does he inter how does he deal with it? He says, forget the purpose. Forget uh -huh, the uh -huh. morals, forget the, everything I think as a civilized person. I'm just going for this and that's it. Well, all these, uh, all these programs here, uh, I feel, do have a positive aspect. Not only are they uh, making things, keeping things nice and calm and quiet here, but it's enabling the inmate to, uh, to start doing uh, more positive things in their life, to, to teach them that they are capable of uh, getting a college degree, of uh, working their avocation, earning money on the side. It, uh, I think it gives them a, a feeling of fulfillment. And the whole idea is to hope that it carries over when they get in the streets, that they show enough incentive to, uh, to make something of their lives and not, not come back. To the public, or to anyone that comes into the institution, it, uh, it's a nice place, it's, uh, the lawns are well kept, the units are clean. Uh, just the physical structure of the whole thing makes it look like a college campus. You could uh, put it on a brochure and people would never know unless they had to be here for a period of time. Actually, those are just trappings, uh, window dressing. The real thing happens in the units when these people aren't around. Danny, how you doing? Look, we're going to hit a couple of rooms. Can I see your roster for a minute? Yeah. Anything you want in particular? Uh, yeah, I'm going to hit Boudreaux's here. Both of us will be up there, okay? 211. Is he in? He's up there now. All right, thank you. Step out of your room, please. I'm going to shake it down. Okay. Stand over here, please. Brian, why don't you take the locker? I'll take the uh, window area.
You got all this all here? All set. It's all set here. The lock is all set. The lock is all set. Clothes have been checked. Okay, Mr. Bujo. Thank you. The job of OUS is working outside the wall. It's to prove that to the administration that you're not going to take off, that you don't have rabbit blood, in a sense, that uh, you can be trusted, that they can leave you in one spot, and when they return, you'll be there. The job in itself isn't important. It's the status of being on OUS that's important. This is one way of me securing a minimum of security, is through working outside. There is a lot for a man to do in here, if he can find what interests him. Uh, but where there's good, there's always bad, too. There's, uh, there's a lot of programs in here that uh, look good on paper. but. Myself, uh, being in these programs and seeing the inner workings of these programs, see, they're sort of contradictory to what the Department of Corrections leads people to believe they really are. They sent a brochure to each unit saying that there'd be a, a program coming into the institution to teach uh, management skills, I believe it was. And uh, so a few weeks later, a trailer came in, and they had their setup within the trailer. And you would go in one door, and uh, they had a few canned goods on the shelves as you went in, and you would more or less act like you were a shopper in the food mart, and you were buying your food. And you would bring these items to the front of the trailer where they had a cash register. And you would practice ringing these certain items on a cash register. And after a few weeks of doing this, uh, I think it was six weeks, that they would give you a certificate saying that you were qualified as a cash register operator. And uh, the following year, they brought a program in again. And uh, I believe it may have been the same trailer it looked like it was. Uh, they just changed the insides a bit. They uh, had a few small engines in it this time. And they said, now we're going to teach you a small engines course. So uh, I believe there were lawnmower engines. And they had the guys break them up and put them back together and, uh, a few times. And then they give them a certificate saying that they're uh, qualified in small engine repairs. These are programs that are laughable to me, you know, that there was probably a hundred thousand dollars spent on this program, but when it actually gets to the inmate, it's a lousy can of uh, peas and, and a, a one cash register thing, you know what I mean? And it's so, it's so funny, it's sickening that, uh, that they would bring a program like that in here. Uh, the majority of guys in here are never going to be cash register operators. Uh, if anything, they'll ha have a hard enough time getting a job as, as a bottle washer because of the, the, the way society feels about criminals, uh, about convicts. Uh, it, the, if they're only going to let you wash bottles, I'm sure they're not going to let you ring up their cash register. There should be more uh, vocational training and better vocational training so that when a man leaves, he has uh, a skill to, to fall back on so he can... Uh, seek and uh, attain gainful employment and uh, not something that's just going to be the minimum wage. Something that's uh, going to put uh, some money in his pocket and uh, in which he can gain, apart from the money too, in which he, uh, a skill in which he can gain, uh, he has a certain degree of pride. Viable services aren't provided for us while we're doing time. It goes back to the same old thing like old friend used to tell me. General Motors puts out a lot of bad cars. Well, right now, the Department of Corrections is putting out a lot of faulty inmates. 
because of the fact that services on back here that were needed, I needed for us. Uh, inmates, inmates themselves, when they do go back to society and they haven't achieved anything while they've done time, they're gonna go back out there and break the law. We just don't have the facilities to, to uh, really uh, get into a particular individual's problems, and I think that that in itself works against us, and uh, that that prevents us from uh, doing what we'd like to do. And as a result, uh, you know, these people they don't receive attention on the outside, and they don't get it when they're in here. So, so what the hell? I might as well try to make a few easy bucks again. There's no, if nobody cares for them, then what the hell they got to lose, whether they're in here or on the streets. Being a lifer, uh, I do have times of depressions. Uh, certain things may happen to me while I'm here. Uh, that uh, it may be family, it may be something that originates with inside here that may uh, make me get depressed. And a lot of times I have thought about uh, uh, not finishing my time cheating the state and, you know, uh, taking my life, so to speak. And, and uh, but I'm a coward. I always was. I, uh, the thought of that scares me in a sense. I feel like I'd be cheating myself if I did it. But yeah, many times I do get depressed and I, uh, sometimes I feel like my future is going nowhere, that I'll, I'll never get out of here. There's a lot of things that, that you can do to keep yourself busy to not feel depressed. And, uh, but when you come home in the evenings after all your groups or something like this, and uh, you don't want to watch TV any longer or listen to the radio because you've been doing it day in, day out for the last five years. You don't want to read because you've read almost everything in your room. Uh, the only thing you have to do is think, and that's your worst enemy, is, uh, is being alone once you're in your room at night. I think one of the problems we have to continually deal with is the perception on the part of some segments of the population and some segments of the legislature that Framingham is a country club. It's by no means a country club. It's hard. All the comforts are home, yet you're bored to death. All the comforts are home, but you don't feel wanted. You don't, you feel out of place. No means a country club. Anytime you can't get up and walk out of that country club, it becomes a penitentiary. seen what they came from, what they've already come from, what they've already gone through. The hard times, I think, when they come here, the majority of men realize how well that they have it. 
and they don't want to jeopardize it because it's a well fact here. And uh, if a man does make a, a larger mistake here, if he gets in trouble, a good jam, he's gone. They have what they call the Walpole Express, and he's right back to Walpole. This being a woman's institution, the only state woman institution in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that houses women state prisoners, they have no other place to send them. Speaking for MCI Framingham, because I have never been in <laughs> Walpole or any of the men institutions, uh, it's really not about anything here. All right, you have a swimming pool, you have a tennis court, you have all of that. They're no good unless they're all in conjunction with a program, a program that's going to be available for you if you wish to take advantage of it so that you can do something in the street. If a street walker comes in here and all she does is work in the laundry for six months, when she goes back out, the first thing she has to do is turn the trick. What else is she going to do? She didn't know anything before she got here, and she doesn't know anything when she leaves. There really are no programs here that you can use once you re-enter society in such a way that you would be able to compete with the job market out there. They're not things that is going to make you have a different life outside. You have guitar workshops. I mean, okay, so you learn how to make a guitar, you learn how to play a guitar, or how to string a guitar. You can't go out in the street and get a job. You can't eat off of that. Uh, they have a drum-making workshop. Um, very few of us are going out in the street and drum for a living. There are good reasons to send someone to prison. Protection of the public, punishment, among others. Once a resident is sent to the prison, however, I think we administrators have a responsibility to make available to those residents the means of rehabilitation. Relax, sit back for a second or two, find the correct place again, and continue to type. Am I cheating? <laughs> Ready, set, go. The, uh, the keyboard and it lights up <laughs> yeah. like I can show you it it lights up um, the letters you're supposed to be typing and you just listen to the thing the volumes on there and uh, it, it's a beautiful system I've never seen anything like it in my entire life and I, I think um, anyone can learn how to type it this time. But it's broken. Do it. Nothing. My papers came. Ow! I know, huh? I know it. Sixteen more days. I know you get all your stuff home. Everything. But yeah. I want to go. Can you I come? Know, yeah, you can come. Sure, you can come. <laughs> I put in May 14th, so. Say six months. I'll be able to see you. No, no, we'll be together on your farewell. Yeah. These are going to be the longest 16 days of my life. I know they are. I know they are. Yep. Can't wait to see my kids and the family. They're going to be so happy. David's counting the days. I know. <laughs> It's like a whole new Christmas world, yeah. like Christmas is coming all over. Mm -hmm. You don't, ha you don't have to Santa say, Claus. furlough, 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 they did not, you know what I'm saying? I know, because he's getting tired of hearing mommy can't, you know, mm -hmm. he's starting to lose faith. But this time he hears mommy can't and it's forever, you know? Yeah, that's what he said, forever, mommy, forever. Forever. Yeah, my brother said, Linda, I think I can do 22 months. 
I said, oh, you can. can. <laughs> he said, I've been counting. He said, and I figured it all out. About 22 months, you come home. I said, oh, you can do it, huh? He said, yeah, I'll do it. I said, bet. I hear him, man. <laughs> yeah. I hear him. Yeah. Like you said, them family ties. That's right. Mm -hmm. The only ones you got. A woman is expected to be a mother if she has children, to, to stay with the family, to stick with it, and take care of her children no matter what happens. Whereas um, numerous men abandon their families or uh, leave families and have nothing to do with their children. And uh, that's not the same as what society expects from women. Therefore, if they're separated and incarcerated from their children, they're not being good mothers. And I think there's a lot of guilt attached to that and a lot of um, disapproval placed on them by society is what is wrong with you? Why haven't you been able to be a good mother? Why haven't you been able to stay home with your children? Um, society has certain expectations that men or boys can act up, whereas women and girls are not expected to be aggressive or acting out in any way. They're expected to be very passive and, and not do, do, to do certain things that will be accepted by men. It's going to take me a while to get used to being out there, I think. I'm looking forward to, to working at a, at a steady job and being productive for a change. So this whole year for me, I think, has been uh, totally unproductive in, say, like a financial sense. Uh, I've had no furloughs, and no work release, nothing like that. I've just been here. I'm in a situation where I have to go out and go to work right away because, uh, like I say in here, everything is just about given to me. All my needs are just about met by the state. Now when I do go out, there's no one going to be there handing me anything. Everything I need, I'm going to have to get myself. And it's going to take me a while to get on my feet. There's no doubt in my mind. They might leave here with $50. Some might even leave with just, you know, 15 or, or 20 depending on their stay. And it would be like two or 300 only if they had done years and years. And that's not enough to put down a down payment on an apartment or to to make a new start. So when you, they can't make a new start, a lot of the times, I think they go back to the crimes that they did to get in here, which would be, you know, just for survival. Okay, your parole officer. John Cole. All right. <laughs> okay, and these are their remarks. Abstinence. That means I can't drink at all. Right, right abstinence. <laughs> working here three years, about three years, and I've seen a lot of people come back. And I've said goodbye to people, you know, good luck. And then a week later, I'll see them. That's not uncommon. Or a month later, and then within the three years, I've seen people leave, come back, leave, come back. I've seen people, you know, pass by me three or four times. I think most people come back because they, they haven't been equipped when they've left here. Uh, there has been no work program established so that they're qualified to support themselves once they get back into the community. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to go home, just take a nice long bath in my own tub, own clean tub, let out a big sigh of relief, sit down, have a big meeting with my family as to what I got to do, 
what I need them to do, ask for their patience and prayers, because it's going to be hard. I want work. I don't, I can't say what work because my education isn't that where I could say, well, I want to be this, this, or that, you know. The way I feel now, if I was to leave today, I'd get anything, any kind of job and go to school, okay? But what I want to do when I'm out there is just work. Nothing specific yet, but just work. You know, I got to get that nine to five, that weekly paycheck to make it. I got to get some standings, you know? Because if I don't get out there and get a job, I might fall back. I can't fall no more. I'm too tired for that. You know, I'm 22. <laughs> Been in jail for years. I'm just tired of it. I want to go home. I want to be with my family. I have a mother, a father, and a brother. They're separated, but they're still mine. You know, they live a block away. You know, I want to help them. You know, I want to be a daughter to them, not a visit. I think pre-release benefits a particular individual because it gives them a small taste of what it's like to be back out in the community, but yet still serving time. And we can monitor him. Uh, we can see every day how he's going to work, every day how he's going to school, on weekends or whatever, when he goes on furlough or whatever. We can see how he interacts with the people back in his old environment. You can't unfortunately do that, okay, say at a Walpole or a Norfolk situation. I say I like it, I don't like it. I like it to be in my house. But I give me a chance to work outside. Now I give me a chance to put in my, my own business. It treats me good on it. I don't have any problem for, the, for nobody. Did you paint when you were in Norfolk? Yes, I painted the whole yard on it. The hospital, the gays. I build a school of in outside. I paint all the house inside. Jeez. A lot of work. For 50 cents all day. That's what you got paid? How much? Yeah. 50 cents for all day. How much do you make now? Now? Oh, jeez. Now I make a good money. Coming to a pre league center, if, a per if they give a person more time out on the street, you know, uh, society could get a better look at him, and he could get a better look at society, and uh, they won't have no labels on each other, you know, because an uh, inmate looks at society as downright no good or whatever. Society looks at an inmate as a high rock convict, you know. They, I should say that the inmate and society should get involved more with each other so they can know, you know, where each is coming from. Uh, I work at the uh, Walter E. Federal State School as a place for mentally retarded people. A lot of times, people think they're mentally retired, that they should be shipped someplace, you know, behind a wall, such as the prisoner, you know, uh, and that's not the way it should be for them, you know, because uh, they're human, that's like everybody else is human. They just was born, you know, slow, that's all, slow to learn. And now you want to bring my hands together? Uh, my hands together. Very good. Beautiful, Kathy. Very, very good. Yeah. You do it very good. Excellent. Go up to your arms. There we go. And get your arms. Go back up. 
back and forth on your arms. Yeah, there we go. Uh-huh. Very, very good. Oh, nice and smooth. It's nice and soft, too. I sometimes wonder about these guys, how they feel. Um, I assume it, it must be kind of difficult to be here. Um, to be technically still in prison, yet to have this freedom. Uh, being right there is the street, it's 10 feet away, yet you can't go out there unless we let you. Um, it must be kind of difficult for these guys to deal with it. Uh, they go out, they go to work. And they're working, they're leading a semi-normal life, and they don't want to remember this place, and they probably don't, until they have to come back. Well, I think the, f the first thing that I heard about the pre-release center was an article in the newspaper uh, saying that uh, it would be in there replacing the hospital for the elderly that had been there. So naturally, I was apprehensive, as everyone in the neighborhood was. Well, I heard of one elderly woman who said, well, now I can't go out for walks anymore in the afternoon because those people are on that next corner. Uh, I heard that some of the elderly women said they wouldn't go into the park anymore because they knew that the men were going over there for recreation. So I think that was the first reaction, fear. I mean, here at Park Drive, okay, we're smack dab in the community. Uh, we're in the Fenway area of Boston. We're the only pre-release center in the community. Uh, we can't be taking people okay, uh, theoretically, that are going to present a hell of a lot of problems to us. Uh, we're in a fishbowl type of an atmosphere. Well, if anybody had a purse snatched, well, the, the first thought was, well, it might be one of those people from the pre-release center. And actually, I believe there were just one or two incidents. When this incident happened, uh, I found out at that particular time that, that he was from the uh, 107 Park Drive, from the pre-release center. He said that he had to go to a um, wedding on Tuesday, and he needed his slacks altered. I took his measurement, his waist measurement, <clears throat> but uh, I was not nervous, but kind of alert in a sense. He tried to keep me in this room here, but I kind of brought it down to the front, brought him down to the front, and uh, I gave him the light. He lit the cigarette in here. And with that, he turned around with a cigarette in his face, right in the middle of his face, and he attacked me. And I grabbed his hands, I twisted his hands, and he burned me. And uh, uh, he had one of my scissors in, in his hand, and he tried to stab me into the throat. Now, this man, in my opinion, had no right to be sent here to this area, coming into a... a close community because he has been convicted for a long time he has been uh, done what he done for a long time and I just don't know why the Department of Correction has brought him in, into this community I'm upset about it but I'm not against the pre-release center you have one bad man among 20 or 30 and uh, you cannot uh, have the other people suffer just for one. We really don't have to play around with these guys. If they don't want to try and help themselves, you know, no matter how much we've tried to help them help themselves, then we don't want to deal with it. And we won't. Uh, we'd rather deal with the guy that wants to help himself. He wants to get back. He wants to change his lifestyle. Um, so we'll ship a guy back and try and get this better qualified man, this man that really wants to do something. Uh, we've come to know Tommy Thompson, one of the inmates, especially well. Tommy has really become well known in the neighborhood uh, because of all his expertise. Uh, he helped the Garden Society fix their water pipe system, which took many, many hours of work. And through that, I was delighted to see that he was really accepted as an individual and not as just an inmate of an institution. There you go. So through people like Tommy, uh, they can see him as a, as a real person and as a very kind person. So I think that that has helped calm neighborhood fears. So after the first year, I think that it changed. Things were more quiet. I didn't hear the gossip. Once in a while, someone will mention something 
about the pre-release center, but they don't mention it in, in the way that they used to. A lot of people don't make pre-release because of the fact that there are not pre-release centers. There's a backlog, a waiting line uh, that's, that's insurmountable. that can't handle the number of people that become eligible. Uh, the overcrowding of the prisons. It, it, it's, 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 it's a vicious circle. Um, one of the ways that they could lessen the overcrowding of the prisons is by putting people in pre-release. But they don't have enough, done, enough of them to do it. It's not me and I'll do it. Is it? The men we have here, the residents we have here, the vast majority of them want to be here. And they understand that this is the best place to be in the system. Granted, Walpole, the threat of Walpole, is useful. Uh, it's a very good tool. And if you don't behave, you're going back. But they also, they want to change their lifestyle. A lot of them, I think, really try to change their lifestyles, to go straight, to become a productive member of society. Ninety-eight percent of everyone sent to prison will hit the street. So I think that was the first reaction, fear. There have been 13 murders, numerous assaults. Um, Walpole builds which character. Include inmate against it's inmate, like inmate against packing a keg full of dynamite. Yeah, and eventually it's going to explode. Mentality exists in here. People leave, come back, leave, come Nobody back. Nobody cares for them, and what the hell they got to lose? <laughs> 